uh, joined by such a great roster of investors uh, to talk about um, basically all things fundraising for marketplaces. Uh, my partner Jeroen was already alluding a little bit to the current environment in his keynote earlier today, and I hope we can deep dive uh, a little bit on uh, yeah, some of these topics and get uh, a bit more granular uh, with uh, the people on stage here. And um, I'm uh, Matthias, uh, general partner at Speed Invest, running our marketplaces and consumer team. And without any further ado, I would actually hand over to my fellow panelists here and le let them briefly introduce themselves. And maybe, Courtney, you want to quickly say a few words about yourself. Yeah. Working. I don't think this is. Hello, okay, this is working. Hi everybody, my name is Courtney. Um, I am at Battery Ventures. We are a 40 year old stage agnostic venture capital and private equity firm. So we invest anywhere from seed to pre IPO, million dollar check size, all the way up to $100 million. Um, I help co lead the consumer marketplace practice there. And we invest in US, Europe, and Latin America. I've been at the firm for five years. I came from an operating background. So before venture, I spent time on the growth team at LinkedIn focused on growth. Um, before that, I helped launch grocery at Amazon. So grew the team from 20 people to 600, two to 15 markets. We acquired Whole Foods. So lots of fun milestones along the way. Um, and before that was at IDEO, which is a design firm. So it was in their lab focused on prototyping venture concepts around emerging technologies. And maybe I'll go to my left. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jasper. I'm with Cherry Ventures. We are slightly smaller than Battery Ventures. So we do seed early stage. Uh, 320 million fund, um, Germany, uh, Stockholm, so um, and London. So we're all over Europe. We invest all over Europe. We like to be the first check-in, first institutional investor. Um, we also like to incubate and help building companies. Um, my background is I'm a VC for eight years. Um, started actually at a different fund, building their Berlin office and B2B software investment practice. That's what I focus on. Already invested in AI like seven and a half years ago, actually together with Battery Ventures. Um, and uh, so all along, mostly applications AI. Before I was an entrepreneur, single founder, bootstrap, my company was a tough ride. Matthias helped a little bit. Yep. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, and, and exited eventually. And before that, I was corporate finance at BCG. I'm more on the practical commercial side than on the technical side, which some founders like, some others don't. So that's me, Andrew. Andrew. Cool. Hi. Um, my name is Andrew Blackman. I run a small fund called Marketplace Capital, and we're probably the smallest of the three, but we are the newest as well. We just launched this year, um, and it's a fund focused entirely on marketplaces. So we invest anywhere between $50,000 and $250,000 at a time into pre-seed, seed, or Series A marketplaces. And my partner that I run this fund with runs a large community of marketplace founders, operators, and executives called everythingmarketplaces.com. So the idea is that we feel like the community provides a real advantage for the fund, and the fund provides a real advantage for the community in terms of helping our portfolio succeed and also identifying investments for us. Um, my background has been entirely as an operator for the last 20 years in, in marketplaces um, before moving to the investor side. I've also been an angel investor during that operating experience, though. So at this point, I've invested in about 20, 20 to 25 marketplaces um, in my career. My, my operating background, I was running a, a ticketing business here in Europe. So I have some experience in Europe as well, running a ticketing business that was very much like StubHub in Europe. We were called GetMeIn.com, sold the company to Ticketmaster, and then ran Ticketmaster's European resale. And that's where I sort of fell in love with marketplaces and the dynamics of, of marketplace businesses. So great. That's, uh, that's my background. Thank you, Andrew. And I think it's, it's great to have like, uh, people with such an uh, operational experience, but also different focus areas. I think uh, Jasper to talk a little bit about AI, hopefully also, and how that is also impacting the, the fundraising landscape for marketplaces. So let's maybe w get straight to it and, and get straight to the gist of it. Um, and it would be great to get a little bit of a view from, from each of you on how do you see the kind of current landscape for uh, fundraising for marketplace companies and maybe one or two major shifts that you have observed uh, in the market uh, recently. And uh, 
Uh, maybe uh, ladies first. <laughs> Great, I'm happy to always go first. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess from a fundraising perspective, and I'll maybe speak on the growth side, yeah. um, <clears throat> I think it's pretty well known that growth capital deployment has been relatively slower in recent quarters, um, primarily just because startups have continued to grow into and scale into the valuation set in 2020 and 2021, right? Um, I do think that activity will pick up in Q4 and, and Q1 because of um, shifts happening in the ecosystem, primarily around two, I think, important concepts. I think one has just been this refocus on growth efficiency versus growth at all costs. I think that's been like the major theme in this conference. It's not an entirely new concept by any means, but it's a concept that I think takes time to reconcile, right? What we've seen is that growing at all costs has had implications to org structure. How many people do you hire uh, to product roadmap? You know, what and, and how much you build in a certain time frame um, to business fundamentals, you know, what you might be comfortable with trading off between paid marketing spend and retention. Um, so now what we're seeing is a lot more businesses kind of um, be more disciplined in team product and spend, and that's manifested in a lot healthier unit economics, which we've been um, happy to see. Um, the second, I would say that's been kind of a fundamental shift, and it's a refocus, but almost like an awareness of revenue quality as it relates to value creation and true enterprise value. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that I think, you know, peak COVID, we saw a lot of businesses that were perhaps more transactional or episodic in nature, um, maybe had balance sheet risk, um, trade like high margin, pure SaaS businesses. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fundamental disconnect in the ecosystem. Um, and so what I mean by that, the concept of it being a dollar that is contractual, that's recurring, that is growing profitably or predictably mm -hmm. should be valued at a premium multiple than a dollar that is not any of those things, right? And so uh, I do think that um, there is kind of a reset happening in the ecosystem accordingly. And I think a good example of that is just earlier this week of Instacart yep. um, IPO. You know, they're valued at $10, $11 billion, much lower than the $39 billion valuation yep. they held two years ago. Um, so I think those are a couple of kind of yep. notable shifts. I, I would say, you know, as an investor, I do think this is an incredibly exciting time. I think the reset is giving rise to more resilient, more efficient, more realistic startups yep. and founders with great business fundamentals. So um, I'm excited to, yep. I'm excited for Q4 and Q1. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good to hear that. Um, how, how do you think that is trickling down to maybe a bit more early stage, uh, uh, Andrew? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that, so it's interesting because our fund is sort of sits in the middle. We have a lot of our invest, a lot of the investors in our fund are themselves marketplace venture investors. Um, our LPs include funds like Craft Ventures and FJ Labs, and we have partners from all different funds that are invested in us partly to find deals. We're, we, we serve as a, as a sort of a large scout fund for them. And so I think it's definitely slowed down, but it's interesting to me to think about us as a marketplace. Like, is it slowed down because the demand is slowed down or because the supply is slowed down? I think that a lot of the the investors that we talk to are eager to invest and like, there's, we don't see as many great companies as we want to see as we've seen in the past. And a lot of companies are like, there's no one investing today. So I think that generally things have slowed, but I feel like it's more of a price discovery exercise. And especially at the early stages, if you're building something new and you're launching something new, the capital is there mm. and the investors are there ready to move. You just have to have the right expectations and you have to set terms you know, at the right level, and you'll be able to, to raise capital. Yeah. That's sort of what we see from the, from the middle. How do you see that, Jasper? Yeah, look, I think um, some people might argue there was a lot of frenzy around marketplaces, but if you look at one of the largest outcomes in the last decades, that's marketplaces, consumer marketplaces. So yep. these things can get very huge, very profitable. But the big question is how you get there. And that kind of path was a bit brute forced yeah. in the last years. Um, and as same as software building, you can't brute force certain things. It just needs time. And and there we see more, as you as you described it, right? More on the efficiency matrices. They're by the way, kind of the same as for B two B software. So that kind of awareness is very important. And then the second question is. When do we see those network effects? When do we actually see this kind of superiority of a marketplace? And, and how long that will take? People have that experience. I mean, you, you guys have the experience, so, so you can actually see the path. And, and that was a big, big change. And I think all this valuation correction was totally right because people were just assuming it, 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 it will work out eventually, but before that, it just cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that's maybe a bit too simple. So we, when we evaluate marketplaces right now, it's, it's a lot this question around what's the path, how you get to that liquidity and so forth, um, which is good, I think. And maybe to you specifically, given, given your background and, and focus, do you also think that maybe AI can help a bit more to that to that end? Or is that like an accelerator maybe in the in the fundraising process? In that yeah, sense? yeah, I think we should uh, yeah. dive deeper into that topic. That's that's yeah. a bit more complicated, but, um, and you guys understand Marketplace better than I do. <laughs> um, but there are various challenges along that way. So how to create the liquidity, how to do the matching of the liquidity, how to actually manage the whole complexity around the data you want to manage, or, or just the back office of documents. Just imagine, I mean, what is Flex? Flexport doing, if you know these guys, huge call center, a lot of documents flowing around, there's a lot of automation going on, and then eventually you're just looking at the costs, and the costs are very high at the beginning before you reach this level of great matching or liquidity harmony, I might yeah. call it. Um, so there's plenty of things we should maybe yeah. deep dive into. I mean, uh, this is, I think, is a, is a, is a big topic uh, also from my point of view, where I think, especially as you grow as a marketplace, AI can probably help you to be to simply get better unit economics and actually address some of the points that you also mentioned where maybe uh, yeah, we were brute forcing companies uh, to grow and but at unsustainable unit economics in that sense. The right? question is how much can you still weave that in or is it like a new wave of companies then uh, that is uh, being built and coming up and like a new opportunity to maybe also break network effects of existing. Uh, maybe just one thing and then happy yeah. to hear your thoughts also. One thing that AI does, or an, any technology that replaces manual labor or, or human human work, is, I mean, lowering costs, you mentioned it, so it enables business models that weren't possible before because they were just too inefficient, too costly, or, yeah, you couldn't even imagine that. And I think from the marketplace side, liquidity matching, all these kind of things, there will be a lot more possible. However, and we should never forget that, AI is not AI, it's machine learning. It's yeah. just yeah, it's just pattern recognition at the end of the day. Yeah. I think yeah. also not just cost savings, but also more revenue, right? Specifically, if you speak about matchmaking, then that's actually adding or should be increasing the conversion, the fill rate, and uh, add more uh, top line in that sense. Yeah? So hopefully create more efficiency also on, the, on that front. Sorry. Yeah. You know, I was going to just say that from, from my perspective, especially at the earlier stages, I view AI as more of an input where it makes things, for, especially for startups, if there are startups in the audience here, which I'm sure there are, you can get so much more done today with so much less because of all these tools that are out there. And so, yeah, there are uh, opportunities to increase revenue, but it's primarily, I think, that the input, impact we're seeing right away is that you can build things quicker, faster, with less people and with less money, which means you can get to traction earlier which means then you can raise money. One thing AI can't do effectively is help you find customers, at least not today. Yeah. AI doesn't solve distribution. So mm -hmm. in the earliest days, I think that really it's all about figuring out how are you going to get your product in the hands of consumers or, what, yeah. or, or buyers um, as effectively as possible. And what do you think to that end? Maybe it's a good point because thinking about what are important factors that founders should consider when they raise and what do they need to be a bring across these days if you talk about distribution specifically is there something that uh, uh, yeah founders should be bringing across or yeah highlight basically yeah uh, as in more what i'm thinking about is i think we spoke a little bit in the preparation of this is yeah. more around distribution uh, uh and and getting customers not just through paid channels but also have some sort of organic uh, acquisition channel basically or like a hook that is different from what is on the market out there and it's just not enough to to and probably also learning from the last two three years where everyone was just pouring money into into online marketing into performance marketing and basically uh, kind of rediscovering more uh, organic uh, channels yeah <laughs> I know yeah, well, we, we see a lot of success in our marketplaces that have shifted away from performance to organic. Yeah. And I think COVID was kind of helpful because there was a different pull from the market. Yeah. It still, it takes time. It's an investment. Um, yeah. So uh, you have to start today or basically yesterday to see an effect tomorrow. So sometimes for these very early companies that have raised a lot of money at high valuations, it's, yeah, it's, it feels easier to do performance and brute yeah, force yeah, again. That's yeah. uh, the easy way. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I think from a growth perspective, I think, you know, what's really important to understand, uh, I guess, is a few things. I mean, as a growth investor, I think a lot about growth and efficiency because I think the expectation at that point in time is that you do have established or really strong leading ind indicators of product market fit. Um, and so it's all about kind of scaling and, and growing efficiently. Um, I think to your point around maybe decreasing reliance on around... What, what would you be looking at then for this, basically? Just to say grow efficiently? Tactically, um, yeah. yeah, I think on one... We look at a lot of cohort segmentation, right? How cohorts behave or, over time. I think averages are misleading. And so um, it's really, um, it does a disservice if you kind of commingle old and new cohorts, but really understanding if mature cohorts are becoming profitable or line of sight of profitability, um, having a really good pulse on like which markets, demographics, channels are working yeah. really well versus not. Yeah. Um, and then seeing if newer cohorts, the CAC is decreasing. Yeah. I think that's a great indicator for network effects manifesting yeah. in, 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 in the ecosystem. Um, the second is I would say like share of wallet. So I think it's a really interesting um, tool to understand how vital you're becoming to both supply and demand. So are customers transacting more and more on the, on the platform? What percentage of your of the total business are you? Are you 10%, 90%? Hopefully yep. you are becoming the de facto place for discovery, engagement, yep. transaction. And then the last thing is <clears throat> every single growth efficiency metric, yep. <laughs> um, you know, LTV to CAG, payback period. And again, I think um, to your point, leaning on product-led growth loops is super important because Paid marketing is such a fragile model, and especially as you know, you see all these kind of like Facebook and so like all these social acquisition TikTok. channels becoming more expensive. Um, you don't want that to. Yeah. You don't want to see that correlation in your like sales and marketing line item, right? And maybe bluntly speaking, so just talking about growth ef efficiency and also uh, more focus on on uh, kind of sustainable unit economics versus uh, sheer growth. And, and quality of revenues. With that in mind, would you then also say that you, ex you have lowered your expectations on growth and in, in, let's say in favor of m more profitable unit economics? Or do you think the expectations are still the same in terms of growth and you still have to grow three, four X, whatever, year, uh, year on year, uh, but, but just have better unit economics? Or is there kind of some rebalancing also on the investor side? I think it's a little bit of order of operations. Yeah. I think before people were just throwing money to grow, yeah. but they didn't know if the foundational business was yeah. valid or had product market fit. Yeah. And so it's it's order of operations. Like the first is focusing product market fit. That tends to be like a critical North Star's retention. Yeah. You know, do customers want to come back? Do they want to use the platform? And then from there, you can then layer on other kind of growth tactics because you know that you are able to monetize off of your customer base. Yep. Um, and then you can have a trade-off. I'm willing to pay up because I know that the LTV is this, right? But without those data points, yep. it's a little hard to create a fundamentally strong business. But would yeah. you invest, I'm just trying to make more definitive statements, <laughs> so I know you, you don't want to, but would you be... I have to speak in vague terms, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> no, but would you, so to say, also invest in a company that is only growing 2x year on year, right? I, if they have... Uh, stellar unit economics and like four times payback on their CAC? Or would you say, no, thank you? Are you referring to a specific portfolio company <laughs> that I should look <laughs> at? <laughs> no, no, no one specific, but I'm just wondering because everyone is talking about it, right? So are we also in our minds adjusting our uh, expectations in that sense, right? Or is it still like, it's just like the threshold is higher and you, everyone, you simply have to grow and I, it's also my feeling, honestly, because you're nodding, that actually you still have to grow super fast, but the the unit economics just have to be great. You'll go go for it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so I think the the truth is, at least for us, yeah. um, 320 million fund, software company, we want to exit the company at 3 billion, yeah. which means 300 million current multiples, yeah. 300 million revenues. And yeah. after that, there should be a perspective that the company is still growing, right? Yeah. So getting there in 10 years, maybe eight years, because that's our kind of fund duration, yeah. well, you have to grow pretty fast from zero, yeah, yeah. right? So I think that's, that's the honest truth here. Yeah. What is also true is growth is different than early. So at growth, you want some kind of predictability because when you IPO the company, there should be predictability, right? There's a yeah. lockup period and so forth. So there are a lot of mechanics around it, but you want to reach predictability. But before you can reach predictability, you have to make sure you have product market fit, there's repeatability in your sales, um, there is actually scalability in the different sales channels, so not maybe Facebook marketing because mm. tough to scale and so forth. So before that, 
I'm, I'm always telling the founders, guys, don't plan for revenue when you just don't have revenue. Yeah. How can you do that? Don't plan for revenue if you just sell as a founder because you might want to have a sales force first and see yeah. if it's predictable. And then we can plan for revenues. I think, but so before there's kind of no pressure, the pressure is rather on the product market fit side, but then it the comes pressure very comes quickly. <laughs> but then yeah. it comes very quick. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> I think that's, that's the truth, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I think that's yeah. true. And, and no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I mean, 2x at what scale, right? <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think it's a math problem to Jasper's yeah, yeah. point, you know, understanding the TAM, because yeah. um, I think that during COVID, there was actually a lot of overestimation of TAM exactly. in, in, many, in many categories. Um, I think there's competitive dynamics, like is it 2x in a greenfield or 2x with yeah. there like eight other competitors doing the same thing? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then my point around revenue quality, it's it's like the entry price that we would, we would, we would, um, we would invest at and kind of what that math looks like from a returns perspective in a time period that makes sense. Yep. So I think there's other variables at play too, but yep. Andrew. Yeah, no, no, I was just gonna echo a lot of it. I mean, venture capital is about growth. You yeah. know, so if it wasn't, it's, it, there's never a scenario which you're not growing or you're, or you're growing no, slowly. Course, like yeah. venture capital only makes sense, you know, as, as yeah. we were talking, as Jasper was talking about in terms of the math, only makes sense if you're growing quickly. You, know, you, can, you can quibble about what quickly means, but if you're growing quickly. And I've, I've built two businesses, one which was you know, SEO driven and one which was paid performance marketing driven. And I think if you're starting a company today, just to be pragmatic about it, it's, it's very hard to rely on either of those channels for, for any significant amount of your growth. Because you know, if you think about SEO and all of the saturation and then all of the, um, you know, the impact of, of AI on, on SEO with generative content, like, I just think it's going to be impossible to compete effectively in that segment. Performance marketing, we've already talked about. We've seen with all of the privacy changes how things have gotten more and more expensive, and that's only going to continue. So what we look for, even at the earliest stages, is a sign that there's an alternative distribution channel, either because something is you know, organic and viral, or you've figured out some unique, um, some unique path to market. So I'll give you one example of a company that I invested in that I think is a phenomenal business, just which took a different distribution approach. Um, which is a company called Fora Travel. They're so, still very early, so you may not have heard of them, but they are a travel business. But the difference between you know, an OTA, like a Booking.com or an Expedia and Fora, is that Fora doesn't acquire customers directly, they acquire advisors. And the advisors can be sort of anyone. Anyone can become a travel advisor and, and learn how to sell travel. And then those advisors go out and bring on customers. And so, yes, they spend on marketing, but they're spending on marketing to acquire these advisors. They're creating careers for these advisors, and the advisors are doing the direct-to-consumer um, business. And so that business, because it has a unique distribution angle, it's been able to grow really quickly over the last couple of years and raise a couple of rounds of, of growth funding, and they're in, in great shape. But those are rare examples right now, and we're, I'm really looking for, and I think a lot of the other investors yep. are looking for, unique distribution angles. Yeah, I think that's what I was alluding to, to, to earlier. Yep. I think we are running, looking at the clock, I think we're running out of time, but I still wanted, because I asked on LinkedIn some people for, for questions, and there was one question that I actually really liked, and I think the person is also here today uh, from, the, from the audience, so to say, and which also ties in a little bit to what we were discussing uh, on, on, on growth and growth expectations. And it's maybe a bit of a provocative question, but uh, those are usually the most interesting ones. So, uh, um, that's a build-up right there. Yeah, yeah sorry. It yeah. Up. Now the say. expectation is very high on this. You know, yeah. <laughs> brace point. yourself, no, <laughs> buckle up. Um, no. So, and the question is basically compared to to other models, marketplaces often take longer to reach product market fit, and uh, unit economics only makes sense uh, at scale, basically, right? When network effects kick in, so you have to kind of invest first in order to build up liquidity. You spoke about uh, liquidity harmony, and then uh, suddenly it can be very, very profitable. So if you then tie that back to what is happening right now, and you think about tighter budgets, m more pressure on profitability, unit economics, do you think that makes marketplace models less sexy? Yeah, And, and do we see less funding there? Uh, or is there like new models evolving that, that look differently yeah, in that sense? Tough, tough question. <laughs> but I think what we saw, one thing that I can say from the keynote is that definitely the funding uh, uh, in, in terms of marketplace models being funded and looking at the marketplace index, it has seen a slower rebound than, for example, looking uh, at uh, tech overall at the NASDAQ, right? So is that a reflection of the environment or any, any thoughts on, on this? Yeah. Um. <laughs> So I guess a couple things. I think um, 
on, on one side, the beauty of marketplaces is that because of network effects, because of these kind of product-like growth loops, because of compounding modes at scale, they tend to have a winner-take-all, winner-take-most dynamic, right? And so unlike maybe other categories or models like an enterprise SaaS, there might be a few winners. Marketplaces, they tend to have like one or two in, in certain categories. And so um, I think in order to yield those kind of you know, outsized returns, it, it does take a lot of time, effort, and capital um, to kind of build out. And I think actually Instacart is a really great example, yep. right? Like 10 years, $3 billion <laughs> raised yep. to build out the first model, which was to aggregate supply and demand. And, you know, the core transaction is has a relatively kind of thin margin, but then once you reach a certain network density, it's then you're able, you earn the right to be able to then layer on higher margin recurring software products, yep. like advertising, like these enterprise products that they have, like the subscription membership platform that they have. Um, which creates a really, really deep moat, yeah. and so um, I don't. It, but you need a very, you need a lot of persistence. Yeah, and, and I think, a, and I kind think, of hold your breath for a long time as an investor and also as a founder, right? That's fair, and I think it goes back to why the interim kind of milestones or fundamentals are so important. Yeah. Like, we're not expecting the entire business to be profitable, but you know, mature cohorts and mature markets have line of sight to some sort of efficiency and you are seeing network effects over time, yeah. that gives you the confidence that you're able to replicate that playbook with other kind of markets. Yeah. Um, Battery's very excited to invest in marketplaces. Very good. Yeah. So, you that. know, you will see capital Still here. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, and you had great returns with marketplaces. So yeah. I can't speak about returns, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, I think one, just one thing to add. We ask ourselves, why is the transaction better on a marketplace than in the current in the current form? And if there's a yes, then I agree there might be a longer path, especially B2B marketplaces, to reach that kind of level. But it, it's definitely worth trying it out because if the customer experience, if the Experience, but it has to be a bit more low touch than obviously before. So, the, to the AI question, yeah, maybe exactly. that opens something up. But also, just simple software, just workflows might open that up. But that's, I think, is the core question. And then, yeah, it's different than in software or enterprise software. But that has a different issue because those things usually are built for very small segments, and then they tend to cap out because it's a point solution or something. I think with marketplaces, they are always built for the big tabs, then, and that's, that's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, and I think, it, I think it's, it's not rocket science, really, but it boils down to whether you can show and justify the investment. So I think that if you need a lot of capital because it's going to be spent on, again, performance marketing to drive enough liquidity, that's maybe a harder pitch. But if, you're, if you need the capital because you've seen that you invest in this part of the product, it gets better, and then that generates more demand, I think that that's what venture capital exists for. It exists to, to, to fund the short term to get to the long term. So yeah. um, I don't think that there is like a, a requirement that companies have to be like profitable from, yeah. from day one anymore. No. If there were, there'd be no need for any of us. But, um, yeah. but I do think that the expectation of what you're going to spend that money on is very, very different now than it was two, three years ago. Great. I think that's a Unless there's something else that one of you wants to highlight is a great note to, to end on. And then maybe we s do we still have time for some questions? Yeah? Okay, great. And oh, I see there are already some. Maybe uh, please. <laughs> From you? Oh, so steal the microphone. Yeah. There's one here too. Thanks. Thank you for that. Um, there is sort of like a lot of talk around marketplaces taking a longer time to kind of get to profitability and growth. But also venture capital brings a lot of pressure. So how long should founders wait before taking on the additional pressure and capital? Yeah, maybe from an early stage perspective. Yeah, um, definitely. Yes, there is pressure, but we also have a discussion around expectations first. So basically, I mean, you pitch the model to us, then you promise something, and we say, oh, that makes sense. Let's do it together. And the pressure comes from yeah, you, you can't, you know, keep up the promise or it's just tough to do it. That's obviously pressure because we're expecting certain returns and certain growth and so forth. But the communication around it is very important for us. So we like to speak very early with founders. We even help them building their companies and, and finding the right model. 
so just invested in a team and they had a different start and then we decided, hey, let's do this together because that makes more sense. But I think at the end of the day, we are realistic. We're taking risk. This is risk capital and we might fail. Yeah, but yes, there's a little bit of pressure. Yeah, yeah maybe, I mean, um, one thing I can add to that is it's, it's like super important to manage expectations. I think Jasper was already speaking to that, but I want to give you one example, and uh, I think they are also here today, maybe not in the room right now, but definitely at the conference, a company that we backed uh, about one and a half, two years ago, pre-launch called Labs. You can check them out on the App Store. They should be number one in, in uh, photo and video right now. They're probably top five uh, overall in the US uh, at this very moment. And this looks like an overnight success now in the last five days when it took off. And it took one and a half years for them to figure it out and really build the virality and nail it. Right? And I think you need to be, as an investor, of course, you need to take that long-term view. But as a founder, you also need to uh, kind of communicate that and uh, manage expectations accordingly. Right? And, and, and then I think we, are, we can totally sign up for that and do that yeah? if, we, if we believe in the path in general and the way forward. Uh, at least as an early stage investor, it's totally totally possible. But always, what always looks like an overnight success then takes like a year or two <laughs> before that, or even longer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a question. So as investors, you're describing uh, these companies as the final asset. You know, they have this LTV to CAC, they have this, you know, retention, all of you know, all of these factors which describe like high quality assets that eventually go public. But if you had to reverse engineer those and think about the design criteria that founders need to think about to create those high quality assets, what are the lessons that you would share about like what you should do and shouldn't do? Because this is an audience of entrepreneurs. Yeah. And it's not just about talking about final assets, but how to design for those end conditions. I have one quick thought on this, so if I can chime in, sorry. I know it's, I'm not the panel, but <laughs> just <laughs> hijacking. <laughs> Uh, and, and then happy for the rest to go, gives you some time to, to think. Uh, I think one thing that I like in general in a founder is more always building the, uh, the company that you want to be and not that the company that you are today. So more really thinking like uh, six or 12 months ahead and also making um, bold bets on uh, hiring people or uh, how you scale basically the business. Uh, maybe even if if let's say the funding necessarily is not inside yet, but I think that's how you create um, outlier business and also having more this mentality of yeah, building something um, yeah, tr truly impactful. Yeah. No, it's maybe a bit fluffy, but I think having seen it a few times in some founders that really always had this, okay, uh, how do I want this to look like in 12 months from now and I'm already building it now, uh, uh, I, I kind of have an idea of what I'm looking for when, <laughs> when I say this. Yeah. yeah, I guess just building off of that, I guess two points. One is um, I totally agree with that. Um, at Amazon, we used to do these like press releases um, in internal meetings where we would write what would the world look like um, in five years and then have a discussion around how to get there, right? And so what is that end state? Um, and kind of even dreaming about that is actually a really interesting mental exercise. Um, the second thing, uh, I won't belabor that point, Matthias talked about it. Um, the second thing is having just a really good orientation. If it's a consumer business around your consumer, it's, it's very simple, but I'll take an extreme example. Um, you know, we actually just uh, published a, a seat of Gen Z report, and I think my, my friend Mira in the back is going to do a panel on Gen Z at at, at 1 p.m. <laughs> um, but the idea is that Gen Zs, um, and I'll speak very generally, have a different way of interacting with the digital world, right? Whether it's search, whether it's how they purchase, whether it's literally how they work. And those distinctions are really important in how you build product, right? And I'm, again, I'm, I'm assuming maybe you're not building for Gen Z, but it's an example around what do your consumers care about? And then how do, we, how do they navigate the world? And then how do you build for that, right? And that s touches on distribution and search. That touches on um, just little fundamental like products. But um, it's very, very important to really be close to who you're building for and having that really close iteration loop. Yeah, and just especially with marketplaces, just this ability to create transactions and value that couldn't have been created before. So I think that, you know, you talked about LTV to CAC and look, looking at these metrics. Like I'm in the... I invest mostly at the early stages, and the number of decks that I get that are like 
pre-seed, we have a few customers, and our LTV to CAC is like 10, they don't, there's no way that you can actually even know what that means, and it, it's, it's really kind of a silly metric in the early days. But this idea that you're like delighting customers or buyers with something that couldn't have been done before is sometimes much harder to, to quantify, but obvious when you see it. And I've invested in a few companies that were clear in that way. Like one is an, an example, a company called Outdoorsy, which is a, a marketplace for RVs. And I had actually tried to go on an RV vacation, and you, can't, you couldn't find anything to book, and you end up booking from these companies, have a really horrible experience, and then they showed me this platform where actually you can book someone's you know, $100,000 RV sitting in their driveway that they haven't used before. And so there's all, this, uh, this ability to create these new experiences that, that couldn't have been created before is, I think, what makes marketplaces magical. And you can kind of see it early on. I think, uh, looking at the time, yeah, we have one more. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Leila from Nina.care, a care marketplace. Uh, thank you all so much for this really relevant uh, conversation. I had a question for Courtney. Um, it's about your time at um, Amazon Fresh. I wondered, different times, um, what, can you give an example of a challenge you faced that might be relevant for us and how you resolved it? <laughs> Just once. <laughs> um, online grocery in like 2015 was, um, was interesting. <laughs> um, it was not, it was first off really hard to build out a perishable supply chain, right? Because it's very different shipping TVs versus shipping bananas. Um, also another thing was, it was a lot about building consumer trust. Like it was very odd to buy meat and vegetables online at the time. And so it was a lot about, um, and I guess it's, it's, it's to my point earlier around what the consumer wants. It's how, how do you create that message or narrative to, to build trust with your end consumer. I think that's actually a really big component of marketplaces more broadly, is that there's op opacity in many different industries and one core value proposition of a marketplace is trust, right? Can you buy X, Y, Z yep. here? Mm -hmm. um, so that was actually a really big lesson learned is we're not simply building out the infrastructure for perishable supply chain, we're building consumer trust and if you're able to access that, groceries one of the biggest cons consumer consumption categories there is, right? It's very recurring, it's high AOV, um, it brings consumers back. Um, that is one lesson learned. Um, what else? Anything specific you would like? To? We can talk offline too. <laughs> Courtney yeah. will still be here for a while, so. <laughs> Sorry? I said you will still be here for a while, I so will, Yeah, can. I will be here for so a while. <laughs> we'll we'll yeah. talk after, <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Thank you. Great. 30 seconds, or are we are we good with all the questions? Or I think there's one or one there. Yeah. I don't know who was first. So, <laughs> hi, um, Jack Recco. As an emerging manager myself, uh, I always want to understand. Right, you guys have three very different funds that have been around three very different amount of times. How do you work together? And like, where is the place of an emerging manager come in in the way you guys think about you know filling out a cap table and around? you know, to give the companies the most support possible. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I can give it a stab. Uh, so <laughs> um, I think when uh, more thinking about how we sort of say build kept habits when we invest in a company together with the founders, I think that's the most important word that we do it together with the founders. So we typically um, would like to lead ourselves, but then of course the, we have a network of um, angels and other uh, micro funds uh, that we like to um, work with. We have good experience from the past, but also people that bring in certain know-how uh, that is valuable to the business and to the company. And of course, they need to click with the, with the team, with the founder in, in the first place. We can maybe open the door or, or, or bring them in, but then uh, th they, they need to have something unique, so to say, to bring to the table uh, that, that um, uh, kind of is their entry ticket in that sense uh, to the to the round? So I think that's how we think about it, and uh, that is kind of complementary maybe to what we can offer uh, as a fund, but also uh, uh, maybe addressing a specific challenge that the company uh, is facing in the in the near term. Yeah. So I don't know if that that makes sense, but that's typically how we think about building a building a cap table. Yeah. Yeah, maybe just quickly. So uh, the way we promise the returns to our LPs, we have to lead rounds, which means we take the biggest chunk. Um, we obviously also work with angels, but the way we work with other funds is we talk a lot. I mean, it's it's high risk. 
a little information business, uh, so we try to learn from each other. Obviously, I won't tell them, hey, I'm doing this deal right now um, because <laughs> I, I want to lead, I want to win. But everything else we share, and that's, that's the most important part for us. Um, yeah. And this is part of the reason why we started our fund. <clears throat> so we don't lead. We only want to collaborate. And we, we always invest alongside other investors. And there's, there's a reason we called it marketplace capital as well, so that anytime anyone's doing a marketplace deal, we want them to think of us and, and think of our capital as being a lot more valuable than just the, the, the amount that we invest because of the community. Um, and so we try to do the same thing in terms of bringing marketplace deals that we know some of our LPs might, might want to lead. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, the niche that we've carved out for ourselves. Great. Then uh, not much left than saying thank you to you. Big thank you. Thanks for joining me. And it uh, was a lot of fun. Uh, good, good discussions. Thanks a lot to the audience for all the questions. Also people on Twitter. It uh, was very <laughs> helpful <laughs> outsourcing my work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining and hope you're enjoying the, the rest of the day. Thank you. Cheers.